how's it going? Today we're going to be looking at a book called The Agony and the Ecstasy by Irving Stone. It's a sort of factual but some fiction intertwined into it biography of Michelangelo and it's a really incredible read. In this video I'm really going to be breaking apart the lessons that I've taken from this book about Michelangelo as a character and how I've tried to sort of intertwine them into my daily life. So yeah, I hope you find it useful. I'm going to leave the timestamps here, so if you want to just jump in between you can. But yeah, let's get started first with the upfront conclusion. I mean, 10 out of 10, this book is uh, it's an, it's an absolute banger for a number of reasons. Firstly, it just does such an incredible job of exploring Michelangelo as a character. I knew literally nothing about him before reading this book. I didn't know really any of the art that he'd created. I didn't know anything about his personal life. But what it really does show you is how a really determined and gritty individual actually behaves on a day-to-day -day basis, both through their work ethic and their priorities. I mean, the book's called The Agony and the Ecstasy for a reason. It really does show how if you have this sort of single-minded focus and determination, although you're going to leave a mark on the world, it's going to come at a cost, and that cost is just so clearly shown. I mean, he doesn't really have that many friends, he doesn't really have much of a social life. All he does all day is, is carry out his art, and it really is just really interesting to read what that sort of life would, would look like. Second, it also paints a really great sort of powerful picture of the time. Um, Renaissance Italy, it really is quite fascinating. It's when Leonardo da Vinci lived as well. There was a lot of people exploring uh, a lot of different crafts and it was a big hot pot really of all these people coming together with some great ideas that then went on to shape the modern world as we know it. So just for that reason alone, I think, of, of how powerful a, a picture of, of that history it presents, um, it's, it's really a, a good reason to check this book out. Also thrown into this book a couple of good uh, romances and just generally a really moving narrative. I mean, he takes us through the phases of his life from when he was a very young boy to when he was at his deathbed and never does the book feel stagnant. It always feels like it's moving somewhere. Um, so yeah, really a combination of, uh, of, a, of a great story, a really great exploration of the character and also just a great depiction of the time that the book is set in. The first lesson that I took from Michelangelo and this book is not to underestimate how much work you can complete. And to exemplify the point, I'm just going to read out a section of the book. And this is Michelangelo commenting on his work as he completes one of his first big commissions, which is a statue of Hercules. Hercules was half man and half god, sprung from Zeus and the mortal Alcheon. He is the everlasting symbol that all of us are half man and half god. If we use that which is half god in us, we can perform the twelve labours every day of our lives. There's countless times in the book where he just takes on what seems a completely unrealistic amount of work and all of his friends are telling him like, look, Michelangelo, mate, there is no way that you are going to complete all of this work. There's one example where I believe he's doing Pope Julius's tomb and he commits to doing like 15 full scale marble models. Bearing in mind, each one of these usually takes him like two, one or two years. So basically committing himself to 30 years of work, something I just consider um, completely unfathomable. And while this does really help him out when it comes to, for example, completing the Sistine Chapel, which he basically did single-handedly and we'll get onto later, there are actually times when it comes to bite him in the arse and he has all of these different sponsors asking him where their work is. But I think fundamentally the lesson of just understanding that you can probably do a lot more work than you think you're capable of is a really valuable one. And the mindset that's portrayed in this book, which seems to give him all this confidence in the amount of work that he can achieve, is 
that every piece of art that he starts working on, he's already sort of breaking down into a multitude of smaller tasks. So he's not really ever getting overwhelmed by anything. He'll look at the whole roof of the Sistine Chapel that needs painting, and what he'll be seeing is tiny little individual bits of art which end up actually making up the greater whole. And I actually think this is a really interesting concept that could probably just be applied to everyday life. How often have you looked at a task and thought, oh, you know, that's a big task, oh, I don't want to get involved in it. I feel like if we could all apply a bit of uh, Michelangelo's logic and sort of break these tasks down into smaller steps, it's probably going to make things a bit easier for us. Uh, an example where I've tried to use this is, for example, creating these videos. It can seem a bit overwhelming. Um, how do you even go around like making something like this? Well, you know, you can break it down, you write a script, you film yourself, you learn how to edit, you learn how to market. Every single task can be broken down into smaller ones and I just think that that's a really interesting way to look at something that might at the outset seem a little bit daunting. The next lesson that I've picked up from this is to relish in the nuances of life and again to exemplify that point I'm just going to read out a short bit of text. This is when one of his friends uh, comes out to him crafting marble for I don't know the hundredth day in a row. Each morning you come out to a different model as though you were going on an exciting adventure. Don't you get tired of drawing the same thing over and over again? Heads, arms, torsos, legs. Then Michelangelo replies, But Leo, they are never the same. Every arm and leg and neck and hip in the world is different with a true character of its own. Listen, my friend. All forms that exist in God's universe can be found in the human figure. A man's body and face can tell everything he represents. So how could I ever exhaust my interest in it? And again, the book does a really great job of giving you some great insights into what relishing in, in nuances actually means. There's an example when Michelangelo is completing the Pieta and he really wants to show Mary as this youthful character. So he spends weeks and weeks and weeks just polishing. It must be the dullest job, you know, getting these stones refining it a little bit, refining it a little bit more, going down the grades of finer and finer stones until you get that real nice uh, polish that comes through the statue. Um, but yeah, just the idea that you could spend weeks and weeks doing something like that is um, a really tricky one to get your head around. But Michelangelo doesn't see it that way. He sees every tiny little detail as something interesting and something exciting. Um, that he wants to bring out in the work and he wants to understand more deeply. And when you think of it, I think that's what really separates masterful work from amateur work. If you look at a great piece of art compared to a amateur piece of art, it might actually be difficult sometimes to say exactly what it is about the great piece of art that makes it so much better. Um, but actually it's probably a number of things, you know, thousands of different tiny little details which all add up to create something that's that's truly great. And I think this lesson of relishing in the nuances of life is something that can be quite easily applied to everyday life, to be honest. Anything that you now consider mundane work, whether that's doing the cooking or doing the cleaning or writing emails, um, try and take a leaf out of Michelangelo's book and just really pay attention to the tiny details Maybe it's putting in you know, the absolute best punctuation when you're writing your email, or maybe it's taking care of the other little details when you're cleaning your room that you might not have otherwise been aware of. Just a really interesting way to look at things and I think just make the everyday uh, a little bit more enjoyable. And yeah, a really cool lesson that I think I uh, got out of this book. The third lesson that I took from this was to see the higher purpose of any work that you're doing. And the quote that I'm gonna take out of the book now is taken from when Michelangelo is carving the David, which is one of his most famous works. It's this gigantic statue which portrays David from the biblical scene of David and Goliath. Yet to him, this was only a small part of the meaning of David. 
who could represent the daring of man in every phase of life. Thinker, scholar, poet, artist, scientist, statesman, explorer, a giant of the mind, the intellect, the spirit as well as the body. Without the reminder of Goliath's head, he might stand as a symbol of man's courage and his victory. What this quote really shows is that when Michelangelo was taking on a task, he wasn't just thinking of it as another sculpture to be made. He had a higher purpose in mind. When he was creating his Pietra, he wanted to show all of humanity's vulnerability. When he, wanted, when he created David, he wanted to show all of man's courage. Hercules, all of man's strength. These were not just sculptures for him, they were something far more. Um, they were something that was to show the human condition through his art. Viewing his work in this way, it seemingly gave him infinite energy because he was just so eager to express uh, the why inside of him through uh, his work. And if you're familiar at the moment with the book Start With Why or the, even the TED Talk by Simon Sinek, he actually labours on this point quite heavily that what separates great entrepreneurs and great businesses from simply average ones is that they start with why. They have a purpose as to why they're doing something. Apple aren't selling you computers they're thinking different, that's their why. Clearly, not everyone is a Michelangelo or a Steve Jobs, myself included, but I think there is something to be said about thinking about this higher purpose when you start completing any task. Uh, an example with these videos, you know, I'm trying to think of it not just about creating, you know, some content about Michelangelo's life, but more of a, I'm sharing ideas try and help people live a simpler life like that's a more powerful why and that seems to motivate me better than just thinking about it as creating something and I'm sure that you can take any work that you might do in your life and think about it in a similar way. The fourth lesson that I took from this book is to do your best even if it means terrible sacrifices and I'm going to read a passage which is explaining what happened when Michelangelo was painting the Sistine Chapel. Um, to give you some context, he really didn't want to paint this at all. Um, he really was a sculptor and disliked painting just as an art form generally. He thought it was flat and unmoving. So when he was commissioned by one of the popes to create the Sistine Chapel, apparently he actually just wept because he just really didn't want to, to do the work. Um, but he got a few of his friends involved who he used to paint with when he was an apprentice. And at this point where the passage takes place, there's about five of them completing the roof of the Sistine Chapel and Michelangelo is not happy with how it's progressing and generally what the art is starting to look like. The deeper he penetrated into the eon-old past of the volcanic hills and civilizations, the clearer his own problem became for him. His helpers would have to go. Many marble masters had permitted their apprentices and assistants to hew the marble block to within a safe margin of the central figure, but he had to hammer off all the corners, mass the edges, work the four flat sides, remove every last crystal himself. He did not have the nature of a Galandio, able to do the main figures and both the scenes, allow the Bottega to do the rest. He had to work alone. What this passage is showing is that even though he didn't like painting and he had five of his helpers who would have meant that he maybe could have finished it in a year and gone back to sculpting. He's actually making the decision to work on it completely alone and it ends up taking him four years. Now, the thought of doing a task that you don't want to do um, for four years when you could easily have a get out of doing a half-assed job and doing it with a few of your mates, um, I think I know uh, which one that I would pick but that's not how Michelangelo viewed his work. He was very protective over what he considered his body of work, his portfolio, and everything had to be to the 
highest standard that he could achieve. He's taking it to the absolute extreme, but maybe that's what it takes if you want to be somebody who's gonna complete masterpieces as Michelangelo did, whether that's in business or in art or in sport. Probably you do need to be completely a bit of a perfectionist. Um, and you know, that word is a bit unpopular at the moment. I'm certainly not a perfectionist. Most of my friends are certainly not perfectionists, but potentially that's, that's what needs to happen. And an interesting question that arose from this lesson is how heavily we value collaborative work in this sort of modern time. When you're working uh, on a product at work or anything like that, it's all about how can you utilize the whole team's skills. When you're applying for a job, probably one of the key traits that you're gonna see is teamwork. And what Michelangelo is actually saying here is that sometimes what you need to do is just get your head down and work independently. So that's maybe something that I've just been trying to become a little bit more mindful of recently. When is it appropriate to work alone and produce something on your own that is great? And final lesson that I got from this is a very simple one and it's always be growing. And the quote I'm gonna read is very short and doesn't really require any explanation. He had been standing still for an artist, one of the more painful forms of death. What this uh, little quote is showing is that clearly when Michelangelo is not growing, he finds it very painful. And this in itself is interesting because often actually the first parts of growth can be pretty painful. You don't really know what you're doing. Um, you feel completely out of your depth. You start to question yourself. But what Michelangelo is saying is that actually being stagnant and not moving anywhere for him is more painful. And I actually think that adopting this philosophy can be uh, a really great attitude to have. Michelangelo would even go to sort of extremes to get out of these little ruts that he quite rarely but sometimes did find himself in. Often he would move cities, so he would try and get some fresh influence or finding you know, different people and different scenery that would inspire him to create something new. Also, there was times where he would pick up a new skill. There's a pretty graphic example when he was quite young and what he would do was break into the sort of local monastery and dissect all of the bodies that were there. This is before dissection was sort of uh, available to people who wanted to learn about it. It was still very much uh, an underground thing that only uh, sort of really extreme artists would, would, would would practice and he's sort of throwing up and vomiting while he's dissecting these bodies and he comes home and he stinks of them so he doesn't get any sleep and he keeps doing it every day he keeps going back and he keeps dissecting different different people purely because he needs to feel that he is progressing in some way and he can't just leave it where it is with the environment that we're living in if you are in the unfortunate state of being in a rut, it's probably actually quite difficult for you to get any kind of change with not being able to move places with lockdown, etc. But, you know, you can really get creative. I've found for me, like, I just bought a motorbike and going out on there every now and then, and sort of cruising around the countryside, really does help to um, get a bit of inspiration and get out of those ruts that we sometimes find ourselves in. I hope that you found some of those lessons helpful. I know that, that I certainly did. Uh, I would recommend that you go out and pick up a copy. It's called The Agony and the Ecstasy by Irving Stone. Just one interesting thing actually is the cover of this. Like seriously, who is gonna buy this book if it's just on the shelf? It really is such a terrible cover. And I think in the world that we live in at the moment where Every book seemingly has a subtitle that's really catchy and a fancy sans serif font and you know really nice imagery. It's unfortunate, but I think there must be so many books out this light there that just you wouldn't look twice at them, but really packed full of really, really powerful lessons. Thanks a lot for making it to the end of the video. If you subscribe, I'm actually gonna put out these every month. So every month I'm gonna take a book probably it's going to be a biography and probably I'm going to follow this format of taking sort of five uh, lessons uh, from the character and distilling it like that because yeah I just find it pretty fun to do. So yeah thanks a lot for sticking around and uh, see you next time.